Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here. Day three of Media Week, we are at the NYSE. I'm the host of theCUBE, John Furrier, with Dave Vellante, who comes in. We come in every week to break down all the top news here at the NYSE. It's our new studio on the East Coast. We've got Silicon Valley connecting Wall Street, Palo Alto, and Wall Street together, bringing all the coverage, building out the network. Subnet here in New York, talking to all the founders and AI leaders on the East Coast and across the industries. It's also Private Equity Week. We had an IPO this morning in Micro. There's a lot of buzz on the, on the show floor. Closing bell should be great. And again, day three of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We've got Amon here as co-founder of Adonis IO. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate Thanks for you. having me. So a big day here at the NYSC. You got an IPO. We got all the special guests coming in. We had a founder's dinner. Um, really the leaders in AI right now because you're seeing this, um, the most prolific investment cycle in generations now hitting. This is a huge opportunity, both application developers, entrepreneurs going after markets. At the same time, the infrastructure is really doing extremely well. Um, areas where there's data and domain expertise is like the perfect use case for opportunities. Absolutely. You guys are in the middle of this. Take a minute to explain what you guys do and then we'll, go, we'll <clears throat> jump right in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, John. Uh, Adonis is a company that helps healthcare organizations do a better job of collecting their hard-earned dollars from insurance. Uh, it turns out that 17% of US GDP is actually attributed to healthcare. And if you're a consumer or a patient, you know the age-old uh, you know, experience of going into the doctor, giving them your insurance card, walking out with a, a copay or a co-insurance that you pay. It turns out that the doctor's office is actually submitting a claim to your insurance company in order to get repaid for the services they've already delivered. Uh, and you know, surprisingly, one in every seven dollars they collect is actually attributed to the cost of collecting that revenue. Uh, and so when you zoom out and you think about 17% of GDP being attri attributed to healthcare and the transactions costs associated with getting paid, uh, revenue cycle uh, is a immense area for AI to yeah. meet data, to meet subject matter expertise and improve efficiency for how healthcare organizations are getting paid. Yeah, Mon, this is a great topic. I love what you guys do because like we're seeing in every cycle of innovation, forget that we're in one of the most massive changes. Labor has been a big part of the of a, an enabler, either better labor output, the cloud gave the 10X engineer, okay, that brought labor, scaling up tech talent. Before that, ease of use uh, with the web, before that, personal computing. We were just talking to Peter uh, Tuckman, who was an, uh, been trading for 37 years, he talked about the old days of when they would make trades, they have one set of books on the front lines and then seven days, maybe they right. reconcile us on the back end. I mean, mundane process. So AI is perfect scenario. Healthcare, I mean, you talk about that experience, like, when you explain that, I'm like, I mean, I've done that many times. I've done paid the copay. I go in for an annual physical. No, I have no copay, I have to pay it. Right. But if I say I have anxiety, or then, I, then it's covered. But if the doctor doesn't say that in his notes, he, they don't get paid. I, some, and then you get hit with the bill. Right. So you have this database mentality, these codes and all this like back end process. You're absolutely right. Okay, yeah. that now could automate on the front end Automation, I mean, I was just uh, with a founder yesterday who's wearing the Ray-Bans, the new Meta Ray-Bans. They're pretty damn cool. Mm -hmm. um, Auto-scribing. We talked to an entrepreneur who's doing this AI thing around transcription. Right. So, I mean, the inbound logistics can automate, the workflows can automate. I mean, this is like a, this is a ripe for innovation. Absolutely. Is this where you guys, are you guys in that kind of process improvement, streamlining? Yeah, so you brought up a lot of good it? points that I think are relevant. Uh, in our view, innovation is defined as being able to do more with less. And so that's kind of the thesis behind why we built the company. We want healthcare organizations to be able to do more with less, be able to yeah. collect higher percentages of their revenue with lower costs associated with that, and that includes human capital. And so everything after an encounter with a doctor is usually subject to a very long and convoluted process where yeah. Actual people are filling out forms, trying to understand the different insurance specific rules against the different codes that they're billing yeah. for, and ultimately are submitting these forms sometimes via paper, other times via EDI, an ele electronic data feed, uh, to ultimately realize weeks or months later that you know, they haven't gotten reimbursed for that claim or they're getting denied for a reason that you know, they didn't quite understand. And so our platform really sits post-encounter yeah. and is looking to automate the creation of a claim the scrubbing of a claim. So how do we QA each and every single document that we're submitting to an insurance company and ultimately 
streamline the AR process should there be a denial that we need to work through. And so the combination of all those things helps us yeah. empower organizations to do more, submit more claims, recover more revenue with a lower cost internally. You know, I love the agility of cloud, but when you start talking about machine learning pre-Gen AI, you have to be pretty rich to do this or skilled, right? right? So yeah, okay, fin fin financial services, they got plenty of money, uh, consumer specifically, but even commercial banks didn't have a lot of cash to invest in mm -hmm. kind of AI. Um, so now we have the ability to come in and change things immediately and show some wins, value extraction, unlocking value of the data and the process. Uh, we had an entrepreneur early on today in the legal area. So legal, healthcare, we all know there's a lot of muck and grinding out process. Um, so, so total get the market opportunity, no doubt about it. So that's a check. Talk about your business model. Um, when were you guys formed? When did you start? And where are you guys on the progress? Give us a quick update on the stats. And then how do you sell your product? Totally. So a little bit of background. I'm one of the co-founders of Adonis. I started the company actually with my younger brother. Uh, so him and I have been entrepreneurs together now for about five years. Our first company was also at the intersection of insurance and healthcare, where we're helping American consumers do a better job of understanding which insurance plans to select during open enrollment. And so that was really the genesis or inspiration for why we started Adonis three and a half years into our first entrepreneurship journey. And so over the past two years, I, you know, since we've been building Adonis, uh, we've raised over $55 million towards our mission across three different rounds of funding. Uh, we're a 65 person team here in New York City and we're supporting the revenue cycle outcomes for over 10,000 providers nationwide. Uh, our business model is really predicated on helping unlock net new revenue and reducing bottom line costs for healthcare organizations. And so our incentives are aligned directly with our customers. Uh, we charge a small percentage of collections that is subject to certain performance imp improvements that you know, we have a lot of conviction in our platform driving. Uh, and so- And you sell to insurance or to We the... sell directly to healthcare organizations. Health okay, the okay. Chief financial officer, finance, compliance, and legal organizations within uh, our nation's health. And they're the ones dealing with all this. Okay, this was not built properly or this Absolutely. wasn't covered. We thought it was covered. Yeah, and so if you think about it, insurance companies are heavily vested in making revenue as hard as possible for providers to, to be able to collect, right? And so there's this game of cat and mouse that has prolonged for decades upon decades. And Adonis is a response to that perverse incentive, that game of cat and mouse, a game of David, David and Goliath, where we want to better equip our nation's caregivers with the tools required to beat the insurance companies at their own game. And how much percentage of time do those health caregivers spend on administrative tasks? So one in every $7 spent by a healthcare organization is actually attributed to this process called revenue cycle. And so that amounts to roughly 14% of spend. Yeah. Uh, and so our vision is to be able to reduce that 14% uh, to improve predictability and reliability for our nation's care caregivers so that collecting revenue should, is as simple for yeah. a provider group as it is for yeah. you know the proprietor at a bodega down the street from, from yeah, where and we are. And that would free up time to give better care than Re getting involved, oh, the claim was filled out wrong or whatever, I got to intercede. Absolutely. At a moment's notice, yeah. this is unfair, or delaying a procedure, that's totally. another one. Mm -hmm. I mean, never mind the impact. Someone could have gotten care in July, but by the time it goes through all that process, it's December. Absolutely. I mean, you see a lot of that, right? Tremendous, yeah. And so what you're talking about is a healthcare organization may accept 30, 40, 50 different insurances across the different geographies that they're operating in, which lends itself to many different permutations of things that aren't being understood on a daily basis. Insurance companies are constantly changing the rules of adjudication. They're changing the way they yeah. expect providers to interact with them. And so the long and short of it is that our nation, nation's caregivers are dying from this death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. And our platform is a response to I that. I used that earlier, a thousand yeah. paper cuts. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So talk about the um, how you guys engage platform. You guys have a platform, is it a SaaS platform? Do you yeah. load it on a server? So we're a cloud-based, cloud-hosted platform that sits adjacent to existing electronic health records and practice management softwares and acts not too dissimilar from how a fintech company might provide you with fraud detection when you have a credit card transaction, right? American Express, uh, uh, Capital One, et cetera, they're giving consumers this really critical fraud detection protection 
uh, and the way that works is by studying all of your previous transactions and saying, hey, John, this looks anomalous based off of what we know to be normal for you. In a similar kind of vein, our platform is studying the revenue cycle transaction data and bubbling up different opportunities for improvement or different anomalies that are taking place across. Okay. So you have service insights into the process. Service insights into the process and then offer up corrective courses of action that then yeah. allow for a reduction in kind of human intervention. So All right, so you've got an API in the cloud, you hit an API, you integrate into an application very easily. Absolutely. So integration, not a problem. Integration's not a problem, although I would say that one of the tailwinds that you know we're experiencing as a healthcare AI company is that the risk appetite around adopting AI use cases if you're a healthcare organization has dramatically reduced. Everyone's talking about yeah. The role AI will play, play in, in improving financial outcomes for healthcare organizations. And so, you know, the ability for us to interoperate yeah. with these systems, but also. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, OpenAI, for yeah, <laughs> the yeah. commercial. But also capitalize on, uh, yeah. you know, this fundamental shift in the mindset of yeah. our nation's caregivers and, you know, the administrators. I mean, it um, opens, the, it reduces the bar, right, in terms of, okay, we get it now. Um, there's efficiencies that we could tackle and get value, unlike the bubbles that have burst in the past, you know, at some point they did happen. You know, the dot-com bubble, I mean, I always say in the dot-com bubble, over inflation of expectations, and then it pops because the financial markets might have been crazy, but it all happened. Right. So it's like... <laughs> Ultimately, the truth ends up playing out. It all happened. So, but AI, unfortunately, or well, fortunately for AI, is that there's a middle point where there's enough low-hanging fruit use cases there's enough paper cuts, the pain, suffering, Absolutely. and dollars are Absolutely. significant enough where you can kind of play small ball, to use the baseball analogy, you get, a, get on base. Right. You don't have to hit the home run. Absolutely, and so I think what's special about where we're building is even that, that base hit represents billions upon billions of dollars of revenue and, and efficiency that we're creating for yeah. healthcare organizations. And so we're not in the business of Trying to hit a home run right out of the right out of the gate, we really want to help. Yeah, because you can. Incremental value. Because you can. Why not get get on base, take right. a walk, or whatever whatever mechanism. Get, hit a double. Okay, so let me ask you a question because this comes up. The pattern of, of of I love this pattern because it's really I love this just entrepreneurial dream scenario. You can land, and and provide a value proposition, and then what's happening now that, that I love and I haven't seen this in a while is that when you're in. They, they see it and then it opens up new opportunities. So question is, what are you seeing in your business that once you land in there, they see the value extraction of the data and they go, wow, I hear those agents are coming. I kind of mm -hmm. get co-pilots. Right. Now, agents are right around the corner. If they get their data right, a little work to get done. Agents aren't yet here, but I'm, I'm, I've, I've heard many stories like, wow, we've discovered this, but now we see three new things. What are sure. some of those things that you're seeing? Yeah, and, and what you're discussing is the importance of finding a wedge into an organization that allows them to transact with you as a tech company, and using that wedge as a way to highlight new adjacent opportunities to drive value for those organizations, but also drive commercial value for you as a company. From our perspective, revenue cycle data is the critical kind of lifeblood of how our nation's healthcare apparatus. What does apparatus. revenue cycle data mean for folks that don't know what that revenue is? Revenue cycle data is basically the metadata associated with every single claim that's being submitted to these insurance companies, as well as the metadata that's being sent back from the insurance company. So it's this complete feedback loop that tells the story of what was performed, what was submitted, and how was that yeah. treated by the insurance company. And so when you can master that really critical feedback loop data, you then liberate a tremendous amount of use cases. You then give healthcare organizations yeah. a line of sight into maybe yeah. what the next three months of working capital might look like. You give them a line you of sight. You give them into, closed loop Absolutely. Process, absolutely. that's proven. Absolutely, and you can repeat it. You can repeat it, and the beauty of it is that because the insurance companies, as I mentioned, are constantly looking for new ways to make revenue cycle harder. Um, you know, the importance of our apparatus or our technology uh, doesn't just isn't a transient kind of piece of yeah. value. It kind of needs to live and breathe with an organization. It needs to be highly personal to that organization as well. I started a company in the '90s with my brother, and. Um, it was a lot of fun. What's it like to uh, partner with your brother? What's the journey been like? How did you guys get here? You said you had another company. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> he couldn't make it. <laughs> My brother's going to come. Like, his brother's friend or bro or his real brother? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, it's a great like, question. I mean, it's been uh, yeah. an honor of a lifetime to build a company with with someone that I trust and, and uh, understand as well as my brother. I mean, 
I think it's true that you can bring the, the greatest talent from across the world and put them on a team and they may not perform. You know, Team USA yeah. is an example of, of that from, from the Olympics many years ago. And so what's more important, I think, for a really strong founding team is to have chemistry and have trust in one another. And so my brother and I have kind of had that because we grew up with each other. We yeah. understand what the other person <laughs> you, is thinking. You can speak without speaking. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it is quite the superpower. I would say our journey to getting here was one that um, was really inspired by our, our parents and our upbringing. We grew up in a first generation American household. Our parents migrated from India in the late 70s. And, you know, we saw firsthand how our parents, you know, teamed up together and had their own entrepreneurial journey. Um, and, you know, really in a, in, in, in a lot of ways demonstrated the American dream to us as, as children. And so, um, you know, as we were becoming young adults, began going to college, uh, it was almost like an extension of our childhood to yeah, begin working yeah. together as, as what we now you call you like a modern the, day family you business. You had the muscle. We had the muscle, and, and luckily for um, my brother and I, we have very complementary, I would say, skill sets. He's a technologist and an, an engineer at heart. I'm more of a business development and salesperson <laughs> at heart. And so the combination of our skills, I think, allows us to kind of own our own swim lanes within the company, but also be highly accretive to each other's, um, each other's work. And ultimately, if you can't trust your founder, if you can't trust yeah. uh, you know, the, the intentions of your founder, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for potential yeah. failure, and yeah. so to have that uh, as a as a pair of brothers is. is and so you guys really got wonderful. a nice track record. You got good investors. You got you're funded. You got customers. Uh, how's that going? What are some of the feedback you're getting from the customers? Take us through a day in the life uh, of of a customer engagement. Yeah. So uh, the feedback we're getting from our customers customers is uh, one of the most exciting things that I think about building product and building software is to be able to kind of test and measure the impact that you're having um, for your customers. Across our first kind of cohort of customers, we've been able to demonstrate a 2% lift in what our customers are able to collect from insurance. Uh, and so when you think about a hospital system or, you know, one of our flagship customers that's, you know, generating close to a billion dollars in insurance revenue per year, a 2% lift is actually a very, very material amount of impact. And so, um, you know, these customers are not only saying we love the improvement and the enablement you're creating yep. across our teams, but we can measure very tangibly, very empirically, the impact you're having to our top and bottom line. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, we're... It must be rewarding. You won, you're having an impact, you're making money, you're solving a problem, and the AI wave, your vision on AI as it goes forward, I mean, again, I would mention Agentix right around the corner. Mm -hmm. You guys are looking good there. You got the data, you're in the process, Right. you're running contributing value Absolutely. to the customer. What, what's the vision of how AI unfolds for you guys? So I think what's important to understand is that AI within this kind of administrative back office workflow within healthcare specifically wouldn't necessarily be as capable or potent unless you have access to the walled garden of data that these organizations are generating every single day. So our focus right now is to really become a yeah. part of the, uh, the measurement yeah. and the ownership of that data uh, which will then allow us to continue to develop new use cases to build agents, like you mentioned, meaningfully reduce the reliance on headcount or offshore talent, uh, and ultimately take those proceeds, take that efficiency, and invest in better patient experiences, invest in compensating our nation's caregivers yeah. the way they deserve to be compensated. And so uh, we think we're very much at the, at the, at the cusp of, of you know, breakthrough and, and our you know, heavily, heavily oriented around just continuing to push the needle yeah. on what's possible. Yeah, it's exciting. You guys are in New York. So it's great to have you part of the Cube East, uh, our expansion of the Cube from Silicon Valley and part of the NYC Wire community. Great to have you here um, and looking forward to, to doing more. Um, I do want to ask you a question around security because you guys are a platform. I'm um, assuming uh, Amazon, you're in a cloud somewhere. Is it AWS? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Amazon, so they have good security. Ransomware has been a huge problem for health organizations. Do you run into that or is that more you're inside that piece? Or is there a security envelope or posture you have to maintain? Does that come up? Absolutely. It comes up in nearly every conversation. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head where ransomware attacks are on the rise just... A, I would say a couple of quarters ago, one of the biggest uh, kind of threats or, or, or uh, vulnerabilities that was exposed to, uh, you know, our industry was the ransomware attack on Change Healthcare, which is a United Healthcare owned company. And, uh, you know, in response to some of those vulnerabilities, we've seen a measured 
focus or an increase in focus on data security. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the ways that we're able to speak to those concerns, those very real concerns of our customers is number one, our, our motto is to only collect the data that's absolutely necessary for the work that we're trying to do, which means we don't really need PII. We don't need to be able to tie back to an actual patient in yeah. order to tell the story of what's happening financially for yeah. a healthcare organization. So we take a very limited yeah. approach to collecting data. Uh, and number two- So I you mean, target the workload. You don't really have care about the other metadata. You want the metadata on that, on those loops. Yeah, you, to, to tell a story of revenue cycle, you don't really need to know who the patient is. You just need to know who is the insurance company, what was the insurance company charged for, and how do they respond to what they were charged. And so we take a, uh, um, we, we take a conservative approach to yeah. collecting the data that we absolutely need and require. Uh, and that's kind of juxtaposed with a, with a best in class, and I would say, uh, years ahead of kind of our age as a company, security posture that we've invested a tremendous amount into. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, it's interesting now. I mean, it's interesting. I, I like, you know, I've been covering the cloud growth for over a decade and especially AWS, they got a very vibrant ecosystem as now everyone talks about ecosystems. Um, just, you know, you're connecting different data sets, totally. different systems. Um, now the word intentional gets kicked around a lot more. We have an intentional relationship. And I like that word, because mm -hmm. intentional means you know, trust, delegation. It's not just an API call, because even with APIs, what's behind the API? I can't have a black box right. behind the API. I got to have explainable AI, because now you have data mm -hmm. flowing into each application. So it's not just a call, get a response. Absolutely. I mean, that was the old way, and that was SaaS. SaaS mm -hmm. was self-service. But now when you have kind of a generative AI piece, right. things are more intentional. What's your reaction to that? Do you agree that that's kind of a better word and that is that a direction that you guys go down to? Because um, that implies engineering closer to the target, which is the customer. Totally. Um, data is more high fidelity, super important for AI. 100%. Yeah, I, I totally resonate with the word intentional. I also think the word purposeful is yeah. important as well. Yeah. Uh, in a world where in not too many, in, in, in the not so distant future, we'll have technology that can actually make decisions and uh, you know, act very autonomously. It's important to be intentional and purposeful. And so yeah. uh, you know, the, the opportunity is as large as the potential risk is uh, yeah. in our space. And so we try and have a lot of tight controls around intentionally and very purposefully leveraging data uh, and also having the yeah. tools and, and infrastructure in place to measure when certain things are breaking yeah. and when we may have gone a step too far or where we might have opportunity yeah. to go even further. It's so. interesting, I mean, we, we have our research team, Cube Research, we have about now 11 and well, certainly 13 analysts probably at the end of the year. Um, we covered agentic systems, we got that documented, our principal research is out on that. We're now kind of scratching the surface at causal AI, which is okay, now what's the causation mm -hmm. of things? Right. Um, so things like next best action comes up, and you mentioned earlier, like, okay, we can serve as insight, but also we can correct. Right. So you're, we're going down that step of the progression. Yep. Okay, we've got a, got a, we got a wedge, we got adjacencies, now we're getting some more action going on, revenue cycles are starting to expand. Then it's like, okay, now I want self-healing, correction, right. next best action. Mm -hmm. This is kind of where it's going. I mean, semi-autonomous <clears throat> probably will be come on sooner, but autonomous is a little bit harder problem to solve, whether it's security or whatever. So this next best action seems to be a big conversation. Super exciting, and if you think about the wave uh, that technology is, has embarked upon over the last 10 years or so, first you had big data and BI, right? And that was simply built to measure or, or tell the truth of what's happening. And then you had machine learning, which was actually developing insights to highlight or, or, or um, you know, identify root cause issues. And now you have technology that's not only identifying root cause issues, but is actually taking action against those yeah. issues. Uh, and so we're super excited about you know, moving out of this world of BI, where you still need to go in and ask the questions yeah. of the data, uh, and you know, slowly evolving into this world of, hey, we measured the problem, we understood the root cause, and now we've action on that root cause, and here yeah. are the results to prove it. What's interesting, Mon, about what you guys are doing, I love this closed loop, and I bring that up intentionally uh, and on purpose, because um, when you think about um, process, mm -hmm. automation, 
trust. Auto, you can automate anything. I mean, you can automate bad things. You can automate good things. Absolutely. Right? So if you don't have trust and delegation, have that trust relationship, what you guys are doing, you guys are identifying these revenue cycles, or I'm calling them closed loops, but once you get those closed loops, you can find another one, right? And so when you get these closed loops, you can actually then start managing those as flywheels. So flywheel's been around for a while. Amazon coined the term. I mm -hmm. think they didn't coin the term, but they made it popular. Right. Uh, you know, the Bezos flywheel. Okay, we get that. But when you get these closed loops, those are business constructs. And that's gold for AI because they're trusted loops. Absolutely. And that's where you guys, I think, are coming in. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I, you're hitting the nail on the head. I think the, the feedback loop, uh, you know, you use the word flywheel. We like to use the word network effect. So when you have purview into enough environments, enough provider organizations, hospitals, yeah. health systems, et cetera, and you're identifying these feedback loops that are potentially problematic for healthcare organizations, you know, you can then start to create this really powerful network effect where healthcare organizations are now no longer having to experience problems before they're being presented with recommended corrective course yeah. of actions. They can actually benefit from the entire ecosystem yeah. uh, where you know, one insight that applies to New York Presbyterian also may apply to HSS uh, or may apply to Memorial yeah. Sloan Kettering. And you can share those insights and learnings across yeah. an ecosystem. And, and you know, that yeah. network effect is super And powerful. you guys end up getting a lot of data as well as a SaaS platform, one in the cloud. You're getting kind of anonymized workflows mm -hmm. that could be leverageable to other things. Uh, we just wrote, um, three weeks ago, we contributed a bunch of stories from our research team to Economist. They published them around digital twins. Mm -hmm. Now, digital twins was it's a manufacturing concept. Most people think of manufacturing, but all they're doing is simulating right. and for efficiency. Right. Now, people think, oh, digital twins, we're not manufacturing, but it's not about being manufacturing. They're simulating process to make sure that they can see things so they have an efficient manufacturing process. So right. just call that a process. Right. You're starting to see these simulations go down across other verticals. Marketing, health, I mean, all process mm -hmm. can have a digital twin. In fact, we call what we do in studio now a digital twin from events we go to. We have an event, founder dinner, 25 people show up, great. AI founders, let's mm -hmm. just do 100 more interviews. Yeah, like, why not? Like, right. So you can create a first party relationship between process simulation and apply that into, I guess, production mm -hmm. in the sense of, take me through your minds. What's your reaction to that one? And two, as this becomes more prevalent, you guys get better because you get more data too. 100%. Uh, so the concept of digital twin or, or synthesizing or creating a synthetic view into the future, I think is, is one that is really important for healthcare specifically. If you think about the amount of private equity investment that has gone into uh, single specialty healthcare and physician groups in the United States. The single biggest challenge these PE groups have uh, as they try and expand and, and, and grow through acquisition de novo is not being able to really measure or understand what their true cash flow might look like two, three, four quarters out, right? Remember, we're in a world where providers are giving the services, yeah. meaning the PE firms are taking the expense, but they're not yeah. getting paid until 90, 120 days later. And if they do get paid, it's not really known how much they're, they're going to get paid. And yeah. so to be able to kind of leverage that idea of a digital twin or forecasting or synthesizing what the future might look like given historic data is something that is really powerful as we look to empower how yeah. the finance organizations within healthcare are able to invest in, in growth, able to invest in patient experience, able to invest in compensating and improving the lives of our characters. And they get more accuracy. They can get some insight into valuation, which is always a moving train to see totally. private companies. Totally. I mean, and like, not, not, like. not to mention that the opportunity to leverage digital twins or leverage that kind of forecast muscle, you can now begin to tell healthcare organizations, hey, I have 90% confidence you're going to get paid on this particular service. This is how much you're going to get paid. Instead of you having to wait 120 days, I'll front the cash to you today. You can yeah. begin to you know, benefit from that. It's you a risk management opportunity on that other side. Right. And the cash comes in, so the more, it's lubricant. Right, so, I mean. <laughs> Money's good, right? I mean, a dollar like, why, today why is better than a, a dollar three quarters yeah. from now, right? And so to be able to accelerate cash into organizations over time yeah. um, will allow 
for material and radical change in, in how well, healthcare is viewed in the country. I love what you guys are doing. Again, I'm a big believer that we're going to see with AI. If you go back a decade, I don't know if you remember, but I think even you know, Jason Horowitz wrote about it. I forget who wrote about it, but um, when cloud came out, they talked about the tech engineer, remember that? Mm -hmm. he, one engineer, because you know labor was great with the cloud. Hey, I don't need to provision a data center. I don't need Hadoop engineers to stand up my big data 10, 2010, and well, then they're going to Spark and Databricks. But um, now we're seeing a 10x productivity on the business side. Mm -hmm. So the business user, the, the physician, the healthcare provider, they're going to get productivity benefits on care. So you're actually coming in not only greasing the skids on the cash flow, mm -hmm and getting revenue cycle information, you're making the machinery work better on the back end. Absolutely. And enabling the front end to be free and clear to execute what they want to do. Right, and I kind of said this in the beginning that we view innovation as being able to do more with less. And you're absolutely right. If you're able to 10X the return on investment that a healthcare organization has on their yeah. internal staff, well, that means, to your point, better outcomes for patients. Yeah, yeah. Uh, better lives for our, our faster, clinicians. And so. Faster performance, yeah. faster everything. All right, well, your brother's not here. Tell him we said hello from the Cube. Absolutely. And appreciate you guys coming in and being part of our, our, uh, our Thank expansion. You so much, uh, take the last 30 seconds and give a plug for the company. What are you guys working on? What are your goals? You're looking to hire? Uh, give, give, a, yeah. give the commercial. Uh, so Adonis is a revenue cycle technology company. We help our nation's caregivers get paid faster and more efficiently. Uh, we are in heavy growth mode, although in, in, in sustainable and, and, and reliable and, and long-term growth. And so um, what we're really interested in right now is meeting with the movers and shakers within finance that you know, operate our nation's healthcare apparatus. So if you're connected with a CFO or VP of revenue cycle at a healthcare organization, we'd love to bounce some ideas off of them yep. uh, and really elevate the discourse around how the administrative back office of, of healthcare works. I always say when you got a rocket ship, just don't fall off. You know, hold yeah. on, <laughs> go for the ride. Yes, sir. Come on, thanks for coming on. Okay, Thank I'm John so Furrier here on theCUBE. We are at the NYSC. This is our East Coast point of presence, our access point. We're creating a network between Silicon Valley and Wall Street, uh, connecting entrepreneurs, uh, folks, leaders, uh, pushing the AI boundaries up and down the stack from semiconductor chips all the way up to these vertical markets. It's a unique time in history, a lot of investment, a lot of change. We are at a massive inflection point and we're going to continue to do what we can to get all the best stories to you. Check out siliconangle.com, cube.net, thecuberesearch.com, all free content. Thanks for watching.